Amen to the singing. Thank you for singing out so much. We're going to be in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Almost went hybrid and called it Ecclesiastes or something in my mind, but we got it out on time. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. The Japanese surrendered in August of 1945. That ended World War II. And then it was two months later in October of that same year, October 1945, that President Truman issued an executive order that really was rather minor in the grand scheme of things, but it streamlined all of the visual identity associated with the president's office. One of those details that changed had to do with the seal, the official seal that you see there on the screen. You see it all over the vehicle or behind them in a press conference on their podium, those kind of things. And prior to this executive order in October of 1945, there was never a lot of consistency. The U.S. has an official seal, had an official seal at the time, and the president's seal didn't match the official U.S. seal. Most notably, the head of the eagle was facing its left and facing toward the arrows. Prior to this, this executive order 1940, it had gone back and forth, but for a period of time it was facing the arrows. So President Truman, one of the things he streamlined was to make the head of the eagle face its right, and thus it also happened to face the olive branches in its right talon. Okay? Officially, the reason was that was a more forward-facing position, if you're thinking about it from a, a military perspective, for it to face its right. It also matched the official U.S. seal. But it also began to be a, an interesting kind of side note, footnote, to say, well, it also is nice and good that it, it's facing peace. Not, never really stated officially, but just the idea. We want to be a nation, now that this war is over, that faces itself toward peace. So that in mind, a couple of months later, he's riding in a train car with Prime Minister Winston Churchill. And in the president's train car, there's the president's seal. And so, as a means of conversation, President Truman said, you see the seal? Yeah, not too long ago, the eagle's head was facing the arrows, but I flipped it around. I had it changed where it was facing the olive branch. And he was probably trying to say, let's, let's make this be a time of peace. Didn't say that, but that's what he was meaning. So Churchill looked and said, what if you just put its head on a swivel? So it can face either direction depending on the circumstances. Now what Churchill was trying to do was be a little pointed, a little humorous perhaps. But what Churchill understood is also what Solomon understands in this chapter, chapter 3. There is a time, an appropriate time for everything. Specifically, the one Churchill recognized was there's a time for war and a time for peace. So we're diving in and letting the book of Ecclesiastes challenging, challenge us. We're reminding ourselves, and Solomon is reminding us, he's telling us over and over again, everything under the sun, everything in this life, is ultimately in vain. It's vanity, it's meaningless. And to show us that, he's showing, I've went through it all, and can tell you from first-hand experience, here's how it's meaningless. But he does more than that, he's reminding us it's more than just a playground. It's more than just a pursuit. See, he understands, and we must understand, that when we treat life like a playground, we suffer. Other people suffer from our choices. And so he's warning us, don't treat life like this, because in the end, they turn off the ride. In the end, they close up the park. The truth the New Testament reveals is that life is actually a hunting ground. It's more of a battleground. Souls, our own souls and the souls of people we love are always at stake. So chapter 2, last week, Solomon has a major realization. It's an important realization in the course of the whole book. He goes through his life's pursuits, pursuing that, that pleasure, that boost of, of a feeling. What's going to give me enjoyment? And he lives so successfully using his own wisdom, but not that of God. And he achieves great success in the eyes of the world. And yet he looks back and he says, it, gave, it gives me nothing. It gave me nothing. After he has that realization, the close of chapter 2, there's a very important signpost for the entire book. And that's when he begins to introduce God. He says, I do begin to find meaning when I live life beginning with God. 
See, once we admit that God is beneath everything, everything begins to have meaning and purpose. And so it's throughout the rest of the book that we find that no matter the topic he's going to address, he's going to pull God into it and show us, here's how God gives us and shows us the greater meaning. That's important because by the time he gets to chapter 12 and he says to fear God and keep his commandments, that's the whole duty of man. By the time he gets there, he's made the case all along. Here's why fearing God is man's all. Chapter 3, the emphasis is on this concept of time and change. What happens when we live and then recognize there are certain appointments and seasons given to life? What happens when we pause under the sun to remember there are appointed times? Isn't it interesting that when we find ourselves being stressed and overwhelmed, a lot of times we'll talk about that in terms of time. Sometimes we don't even really make a comment about time itself. We're just having to find the words to express ourselves, and it ends up involving time. We use these phrases quite frequently, don't we? We run out of time. Time flies by. The time passes by before you know it. We say that one often. I don't have the time. I don't, I don't even have the time to breathe, perhaps. I wish I had more time. I wish I could go back in time. We bring up those casual phrases just to recognize we regularly connect the passing of time with the feelings of stress and disorder or uncertainty. Here's what Solomon's point in chapter 3 is going to be. Time and change often make us feel uncomfortable. And it's God who wants it that way. Time and change often make us feel uncomfortable and overwhelmed, but God has designed the world and us with that purpose in mind. Confusion and anxiety often happen with these things because we realize we are not in control. So when we have that realization, it should remind us who in fact is in control. So when we find ourselves feeling overwhelmed by time, we must keep turning toward God who has created all things and given them their time. So the first observation here from the first 11, or actually the first 13 verses, is the observation that time is cyclical. Time keeps going around and around. There's a season for everything. It goes around, it comes around, it is what it is, it happens when it happens. That's, that's true about life. And so we need to see that God is the one who gives security even though life is constantly changing. So let's read the opening verses of chapter 3. Verse number one, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn, a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. The observations we need to remember from these verses. We see that first they're summarized in verse 1. There is a season or a time for everything under heaven. Under heaven similar language to under the sun. It's everything in this plane comes and goes. There's a time for it all. And season is a helpful synonym for the word time in this chapter. He's not saying there is absolute time, that you can clock it and say, well, a time to be born is exactly this minute and hours. That's not what he's saying. There is a season, even an appointed time or appointed season for birth, for death, for war, for peace, for love, for hate. And then what he does is showing these 14 pairs they're opposites or even contradictory at times. And what that reminds us of is because there's a time for both ends of the spectrum, that necessitates change. There is a time for everything under God's creation. And because everything gets its day, that means there's constant change. So change ends up being the only thing we can truly count on happening in life under the sun. Life on God, life on this planet... The only thing you can count on happening is things changing. So what do we do with that? 
What we find is we cannot find meaning there alone because everything keeps changing. So here's what he says, beginning of verse number 9. What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so he, that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. Verse 12, I perceived that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in his toil. This is God's gift to man. Now verses 9 and 10, 12 and 13 have all more or less been repeated prior to this. But verse 11 stands out. Verse 11 is unique to the book of Ecclesiastes now. It has not been spelled out that way until now. So what he's saying is, here are some parameters we've already said and established before in chapter 2. But now in light of the changing nature of life, verse 11 is how we begin to find the meaning and enjoyment that God makes available. So notice the two, two key phrases in verse 11. God has made. So God is the source. God has made everything beautiful in its time. Now the word beautiful here would certainly include some aesthetic qualities. It, it appears beautiful. But the deeper meaning really has to do with function. It's functionality. Most of us wouldn't take the, the gears and the chain and the wheels from a bicycle and hang them on a wall and say, well, that's beautiful art. But when you look at the mechanics of how the gears and the chain work together and how they spin the tires, you would say, wow, that's impressive, that's amazing. That's more of the idea he's talking about here. God has put every season and everything happening in a functional place, a functional time. So what that means for us is that when we see God has put everything there, we begin to see Him more and more. We begin to find the enjoyment He makes available in that season, whatever it might be. You know, sometimes we might act like we don't like change. I don't think we could ask anybody here, hey, hey do you like change? Most people would say, no, change is hard. Change challenges me. I, I'm a little anti-change. And yet if we also went around the room and we asked everybody, what's your favorite season of the four? I don't know the order, but I can guarantee the top two would be spring and fall, right? We don't like change, but we like spring and fall. Those are seasons of change. Summer and winter, things are more static. We embrace change because why? We see its functionality. It serves a functional purpose. I have a friend who preaches in North Carolina. He posted this picture from the North Carolina Weather Authority. Fall leaves are changing in the foreground. This is Elk Mountain, it says, Elk Park. And in the background, you see the frost and the freezing temperatures. And we would say that is aesthetically beautiful. But we love and appreciate that because we know there's so much more beneath the surface. It's functioning as God has designed it. He has made it beautiful in its time. God has made this world the best possible world for us to live in and to thrive. And when we realize that, that makes it beautiful. We appreciate it. The other phrase in verse 11 is that he has, put a man, he has put eternity into man's heart. God has placed eternity into man's heart. Now this is one of the most familiar phrases in the entire book. And yet it's still a little ambiguous as to what it means. It is positive and I think it should motivate us and give us a sense of gratitude. But it cannot all be good because you just keep reading. What does he say after it? He says, yet yeah, so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. It's ambiguous, but it still helps us to learn there's something different between us and God. He has placed a longing within us that causes us to remember and to know this life is not all that there is. He has placed something within our hearts that causes us to realize we're limited. And knowing that we're limited also means there's something greater than us. That we get to live for beyond the time and the place we're in. And so Sol Solomon is telling us the one reason we can find enjoyment and pleasure with God, it's because we learn to enjoy that everything has a time or its season, and it has a purposeful gift from God.
in mind. That means if something has a purpose, someone has given it that purpose, and God is that someone. And when we turn our minds toward apologetics, you sometimes hear it said, every design has a designer. That's what Solomon is arguing. Everything has its season and its place and its time. Who has given it that? It's God who's behind it all. Everything has a function. Who gave it the function? God did. Who created the environment and the system within, within which it does function? God is the one who has. We need to learn the truth that if everything were truly random, the universe, the life itself would be unsurvivable and unpredictable. The psalmist would say this in Psalm 100. 19, verse 89, you're forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. See, he's talking about time. God's faithfulness endures throughout. You have established the earth. It stands fast. And by your appointment, they stand this day. The generations, the earth, they stand because God has decreed that they stand. All things are your servants. And then he says, if your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. You see, he's connecting the same dot Solomon does here in chapter 3. I recognize God was behind it all. He appointed and hung everything in its right place. And even when the change keeps cycling around, and we could feel overwhelmed, I can step back and see God has caused it to work that way. One final illustration about this whole thing and how it becomes a beautiful thing. Professor Fried Hardeman, uh, now the dean of the, the School of Biblical Studies, Dr. Mark Blackwelder, is the one who, who um, has used this before about this chapter. He says, if you take someone who knows nothing about the mechanics of an automobile and you put him or her inside the internal combustion engine and you turn it on and they see and feel and hear that explosion that happens within, they would jump. They would be shocked. They would be surprised. And then it explodes again, and then again, and then again. And they're caught off guard because that's an explosion. That's scary. But then they're told it's okay. Nothing, nothing bad is happening. And in fact, it's more than okay. It's actually good. It's actually been placed there and designed there by engineers and mechanics. They have dictated that the engine explodes in a very certain way, so that it then generates power. Once you step out to see the whole process, you can then begin to appreciate even the thing that otherwise would be scary. Is a life full of change scary at times? Yes. Well, who's behind the constant changing of the seasons, the seasons of life? Well, God is. Why? Because he has a greater design in mind. But this illustration about the car engine, the combustion engine, is also helpful because in the text of Ecclesiastes 3, beginning in verse 14, he's going to move away from the cyclical nature of time toward the linear nature of time. Time keeps advancing forward. Well, likewise, the car engine does far more than just sit there and those cylinders go up and down. No, it drives the vehicle forward. And likewise, we must see that while God is our source of security and change, he is also, also the one who gives us direction to look toward future with. Time is also constantly marching forward. We must cling to him and learn from him as we begin to see that depth. What's interesting to, to note here is from verses 1 through 13, we could get a lot of agreement from a lot of people around the world. People with a casual belief in God would read verses 1 through 13 and say, oh, well, that makes sense. I can trust a God who's behind it all, and, and there must be something bigger. Yeah, I get that. But now Solomon is going to dive in deeper and, and challenge us all to see what are the implications of God being behind it all. So now look at verse four, number 14. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. That which is already has been. That which is to be already has been. And God seeks that which has been driven away. You hear the sudden shift? Under the sun, everything is constantly changing. Everything is beautiful in that change and in its time. But when it comes to God, verse 14, things are different. He doesn't change. Whatever God does endures forever. 
You can't add to it. You can't take away from God. God's God. So these thoughts should ultimately be grounded in how God is the one who never changes. Time is like it is because of the nature of God. He, in his infiniteness, if you will, has designed our concept of time in order to ultimately lead us to seek him. And that must keep reminding us that we live in a different, lower plane than God does. So that, verse 14, we will come to fear him. And that's important because we must keep learning that our purpose for living cannot come from the things of this world. Because what do we learn in the first 13 verses? They keep changing. They cannot become the source of meaning and purpose and life and fulfillment because they will not last. Only God lasts. Final phrase of verse number 15. God seeks what has been driven away. Pretty challenging, humbling thought there. Because under the sun, once we realize time is linear, we can't go back in the past and change anything, can we? We understand the past is in the past. It's gone. That moment, that minute, that hour, it's already spent. Solomon is saying with God, remember things are different. And things that we would say in the past, God can go back and fetch. What's he going to say in chapter 12? Whole duty of man is to fear God, keep his commandments, because we will all have to answer to him on judgment. He will bring into judgment everything we've done. That's what he's saying here in verse 15. Anything that's happened, anything that's been done, he can fetch it back and we'll bring it to light one day. But now we move to verse 16. It begins to zoom into the creation. Here we've seen verses 14 and 15. What's it like with God and how does that connect to our view of time and change? Well, now he begins to kind of connect the dots. So verse number 16. Moreover, I saw under the sun, so that's the, the place of earth, that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness. And in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. And I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and for every work. Now that we look at the things of man, what Solomon recognizes is, all right, there's a time for everything, but sometimes those everythings overlap. And one of those things is that there's a time for free will, a time for choice. Man gets to choose. And so under man's terms, I went to the place where righteousness was supposed to exist, and I still found wickedness. I went to the place where, where justice was supposed to be, and there was still wickedness. You hear what he's getting at? He's wrestling with the same questions that we wrestle with. And one of the hardest questions for us to grapple with is, how is it that, that wickedness still exists like it does? And that even good people suffer. The righteous suffer. The just suffer. Why, why is that happening? And the truth is, is that sometimes good people suffer because of bad people. Sometimes good people suffer because people who are trying to be good still make bad, poor choices. But notice this. Here's the promise. Even wickedness has its day. Even wickedness and evil will have their time. It may appear as though it's flourishing in this life. It may appear as though it's getting away with it under the sun. But Solomon is saying there will come a day when it will have its time, and that time is that they will answer to God himself. He resolves this tension by reminding even the most terrible and difficult things we have to face will have their day before the throne of God. But then notice next what he does. Verse number 18. I said in my heart with regard to the children of man that God is testing them. Here we get back into God's purpose. What does God want to see in us when we realize this? God is testing them that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. For what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beast is the same. As one dies, so, does, so dies the other. They all have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beasts, for all is vanity. All go to one place. All are from dust, and to dust all return. Do you hear that language? God is testing them to see, so that they may see that they are but beasts. Are we willing to start out with our thinking, knowing that there's a level at which we're the same as beasts, animals? Are we humbly willing to admit that when it comes to us and God, we're but mere beasts? That's what he's wanting us to see. He's wanting us to begin looking at him with the humility necessary to trust him with everything. 
The more we see ourselves as gods, the more we begin to act like animals and act like beasts. So God wants us to see the foundation is we're not God. We're but beasts before his holy and mighty and perfect will. Remember King Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel chapter 4? He was warned about this, and he did it anyway. He looked out, and he said, look at my kingdom. Look at what all I've done, what I've built. And immediately, he was made to act like a beast. He grew hair, fingernails, all of that. Had to eat the, the grass of the, the earth. And he was humbled by it. And the humble realization he came to was his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. Do you hear the time element? Nebuchadnezzar learned he is God of all time, generation to generation. Then he says, none can stay his hand. None can control God's hand. None can say to God, what have you done? God wants us to learn there's a difference between us and him. And when we realize that difference, we'll then cling to him and follow his will. The ending of um, the original Planet of the Apes, that's, that's a realization that we have as the viewer. The title's a little deceptive. The Planet of the Apes is not just the planet they find thousands of years in the future. He finds the evidence that this is still Earth and that man had acted like animals a couple thousand years before and now you've got animals doing the same horrific things that man was doing before. So often, when we live under the sun, instead of living for God, we begin to treat each other terribly. We don't remember that we're but beasts for God. We begin to think we're gods. And so we mistreat. Is there evidence that we begin to treat each other like beasts instead of like God would have us to, like souls? What happens when we view ourselves as gods and thus begin treating like, acting like animals? Well, here are a couple of ideas that quickly come to the surface. We fulfill every sexual urge without restraint, normalize those perversions. The things that Jesus specifically preached against, fornication, adultery, lust, those are now normalized and accepted. And the things that we could never have imagined are on the fast track for normalization now. What about judging others on appearance, on location, other factors, poverty level, social status? That's an animalistic thing to do. Killing the vulnerable. You take any line, any spectrum on the timeline, the young, the old, the sick, the chronically ill, the addicted, and all are seen as expendable. They drain too many resources. That's an animalistic perspective and behavior. The idea that might makes right, the end justifies the means. Whatever can be done to advance humanity is worth doing and worth whatever the risk is. The greatest risk is not advancing. That's an animalistic mentality. Instead of an attitude that humbles itself before God. Psalm 75, beginning of verse number 2. At the set time that I appoint, there's that appointing language. Set time I appoint, I will judge with equity. There is a timeline of the future, it's, uh, uh, and it's heading into the future. And it will, we will all stand before God. And so we must know that impacts us now. When the earth is tottering and all its inhabitants, it is I who keep steady its pillars. I'm behind it all, so look to me now knowing you'll see me and answer to me in the future. Not from the east or from the west, not from the wilderness comes lifting up, but it's God who executes judgment, the putting down one and the lifting up of another. As we see the end of the chapter, we see verses 20 and 21, 21 and 22, they may perhaps be the two most important verses of the chapter. Verse 11 would, would be right there with it as an important verse. But listen to the questions he asks in these last two verses of the chapter. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth. So I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. Who can bring him to see what will be after him? So recognizing that God is the God of cyclical time, God is the God of linear time, and he wants us to see there's a level at which we are but beasts, so that we'll turn to him. He now says... Who can tell the difference in the afterlife? Who knows? Rhetorically, it's an unanswerable question. If you're living under the sun, if all we're using is science and logic and philosophy, we cannot answer either question. We cannot answer what's the difference in man and beast after death. 
And we cannot answer who will tell what is to become after him. We cannot say what's going to happen on earth after we die. We can't say what's going to happen to the soul after we die. Those are only answerable questions when we start with God. Time and change are unavoidable. But God secures us and directs us toward a future where those answers are not only possible, but we enjoy them. We rest in them. So not only does he give us these questions to challenge us, but when we know the true God, they are sources of hope. They reveal to us, remind us of his mercy. See, a person who's living like he lived in chapter 2 for things under the sun, his only concern is, what's going to happen to my stuff when I leave? What's going to happen to my name when I leave? What's going to happen to my children and grandchildren and my legacy? There's different questions for the person who knows God. What about my soul? What about God's glory? What about other people's souls that mean so much to me? We can advance toward that future as uncertain as it may be. We can advance toward that future with direction from God. The final reminder we need this morning is that of Jesus Christ. And the reminder that he is the ultimate answer. There's that longing in our hearts, the eternity in our hearts. This constant nagging that every person has knowing there must be something greater. Christ is the one who will fulfill that within us. Paul, speaking to a very um, academic-minded audience in Acts chapter 17, similar to our own, perhaps, in some ways. And he says, God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having, listen to the language, determined, allotted periods in the boundaries of their dwelling place. Everything has its time and season. That's what Paul is saying. Verse 27, that they should seek God. Solomon says when we realize this, it's given to us so that we will learn to fear God. Well, that's what Paul is saying here. They should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he's actually not very far from us. There is a great distance when we see our nature versus his. But there is a closeness too. It's in him we move and have our being. We are his offspring. He's going to quote from their poets. He's also near us because he sent his son to be like us, to take on flesh. And so as he winds down his sermon, here's what he says. The times of ignorance God overlooked. Seasons of ignorance. The times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed, appointed, set a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. He has appointed a time, he has appointed a man, a savior. And the end of this, and of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. He's appointed a savior to stand with us, to stand for us at the appointed time of judgment. That time is coming, but Christ feels the longing. And Christ gives us the fulfillment we need until that day. What a great Savior and God he is to give us his son. He wants to be that Savior, your Savior today. A couple of quick three you know, observations for all of us. The next time we feel the stress, the stress that comes from thinking about time and change, that's our cue, that's your cue to stop and to turn toward God. Stop and turn toward him in prayer. Stop and turn toward him in studying of his word. Stop and turn toward his people in worship and in service. Perhaps it's been a while, maybe. There's a different category, perhaps, where it's been a while. It's been too long since you felt that sense of, of overwhelm. That maybe you've been so busy and so distracted that you've not paused. That you've not paused long enough to realize that time is fleeting. Be clear about Ecclesiastes chapter 3. God wants you to wake up out of that. God does not want us living in this plane of existence where we're moving from one thing to the next without pausing to think, especially to not think about him. And perhaps you've been in a season of sin for far too long. Maybe your life has gotten away from you to the degree that you have gotten away from the Lord. Please know that this morning God is 
just as good and just as gracious as he's always been. He longs to forgive you. Because he's a great Savior, he wants to save you today. Please know that we're here for you. If you have the need to put him on a baptism, let today be that day. If you need to come back to him, let today be the day as well. Would you come as we sing together?